Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 26th year in business. It's midday, Thursday, June 25th, 2015, and the title of this week's audio blog is What's Going On Out There and How Does It Affect Us? Now, a few weeks back, I had a conversation with David Sheckman, our CEO and co-founder, about the state of the world, Miles Franklin's business, and how we are personally responding to such. Both of us, as I imagine many of you are, have taken precautionary measures to shield ourselves from what is clearly a deteriorating economic environment. And as our business involves the sale of assets the government has deemed enemy number one, and thus taken draconian steps to suppress them, we have been particularly diligent in doing everything imaginable to protect ourselves. In my case, I reviewed every aspect of my daily operating expenses, with an effort of reducing my cost of living as best I can. In David's, he has not only taken all the fat out of Miles Franklin, making it lean, mean, and thus prepared for even the weakest precious metal demand environment, but sold his Miami condo to take his personal finances out of harm's way, given how essentially all aspects of the high-end real estate market are screaming bubble at the top of their lungs. And trust me, if interest rates continue to climb, whether due to Fed cycle babble, heightened investor risk aversion, or inflation-fearing bond vigilantes, you can kiss equities, real estate, and essentially all aspects of the already dying global economy goodbye. Heck, here in the States alone, not only are such markets, not to mention the bond market itself, trading at all-time high valuations amidst the weakest economic environment in generations, and the most across-the-board debt saturation of all time, but the very same subprime markets that catalyzed the 2008 financial crisis have been reanimated by Wall Street to their former bloated sizes, just waiting for the fuse to blow them sky high. To wit, subprime mortgage lending is rising so rapidly, in large part due to new suicidal schemes from the newly nationalized mortgage providers Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that more than 50% of all new home, home purchases require less than a 10% down payment. But this time around, these shoddy, guaranteed-to-implode mortgage subprime lending practices have been turbo-boosted by an exploding subprime auto lending market, which has dramatically surpassed its 2008 peak, with many such loans now being given for more than the value of the rapidly depreciating assets underlying them. Throw in the record-high channel stuffing by car manufacturers like GM, undoubtedly due to the influence of having the U.S. government as its majority shareholder from 2009 to 13, and you have the massive deformation of an historically indebted society holding historically high amounts of auto loans with an historically high supply of vehicles driving automobile value, values down and an historically weak economy making it more and more difficult for borrowers to repay said loans. Just yesterday, for example, I read that 29% of all American adults, i.e. 70 million people, have no emergency savings at all. And these are the very people amidst the lowest labor participation rate and real household incomes in four decades holding such loans. Adding insult to injury, the dramatic collapse of U.S. homeownership from 69% of the population to 63% in just the seven years since 2008 means that millions of former homeowners are now competing for a shrunken supply of rental units. A trend, I might add, that was greatly exacerbated by the Fed lowering rates to zero, thus enabling Wall Street venture capitalists to snap up foreclosed homes at nearly zero borrowing costs. In other words, the Fed prevented homes from becoming more affordable to citizens, which would have occurred in a freely operating capitalist economy. Instead, they put them in the hands of the very speculators they just bailed out at nearly no cost, allowing them to either hoard the homes or become slumlords to millions of dispossessed former homeowners. And as you can imagine, the, for all intents and purposes, rental monopoly the Fed inadvertently created has caused rental prices to soar, on average by an incredible 23% since 2008, which is probably why a record 50% of renters were spending more than 30% of their incomes on rent last year, including 23% spending more than 50% of their incomes on rent. To wit, the perfect timing of this commentary, which as I write, was validated in spades by the May personal income and spending data, depicting how the average American already holding a record amount of debt spent twice as much as he earned in May. The difference, of course, being funded by increased debt at increasing interest rates. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? And by the way, the biggest component by far of the public's May borrow and spend surge was, drumroll please, a 5% surge in energy-related expenditures. In other words, the higher gasoline prices that the oil PPT 
which refuses to allow WTI crude to fall below $60 per barrel, has wrought on the already dying American consumer. But I digress, as I wanted to go a bit deeper into my discussion with David Checkman from roughly a month ago. David's been writing publicly about the economy and markets for as long as I have, as the Miles Franklin blog, which for many years consisted solely of his writings, nearly dates back to the beginning of the precious metal bull market at the turn of the century. More importantly, in his role of running one of the largest bullion dealers in the country, he has been communicating with retail gold and silver investors, or as I call them, savers, for 15 years, enabling him to accumulate a priceless trove of insight into their collective psyches. I should know, as I'm one of them. That said, given my specific expertise in financial markets, and particularly gold and silver markets, I tend to have less concerns and fears than most. Moreover, as I skewed my entire paper PM investment portfolio in lieu of physical metal four years ago, I have shed myself of the additional mental burden of holding assets subject to general market crashes as well as the vagaries of particular companies. Many gold and silver holders still own such assets, like mining shares, ETFs, and closed-end funds, which are suppressed far more than even physical metal prices. And thus, not only have their losses been greater, but their psyches more heavily damaged. David and I discussed these topics at length, including, as you can imagine, how the blog's utility can be maximized in helping such readers to navigate the extremely trying circumstances they have been forced to endure. In other words, per the title of today's audio blog, what's going on out there and how does it affect us? Each day, I do my best to describe every imaginable aspect of the U.S. economy and financial markets, as well as any and all relevant goings on the world round. After all, the economy, financial markets, and of course gold and silver pricing are as intertwined more than ever, and care of the hist history's largest fiat Ponzi scheme, in which not a single currency is backed by anything but vacant government promises, economic and financial events halfway around the world now have the ability to dramatically impact our lives. Moreover, with the world's central banks, large and small, in the throes of what I call the final currency war, in which they all desperately seek to weaken their currencies in a futile, politically motivated attempt to garner jobs that never seem to materialize, it couldn't be more obvious that said Ponzi scheme has commenced its terminal stage. Consequently, whilst rigged government statistics tell us deflation is our greatest fear, the reality is that our cumulative cost of living is rising dramatically, and significantly more so in nations not possessing leading currencies like the dollar, euro, and yen. In other words, the less utilized a currency is, the more dramatic the inflationary impact of money printing. And given the gargantuan QE, ZERP, and even NERP, or negative interest rate policies, currently being used by the Fed, ECB, Bank of Japan, and nearly all major central banks, the global inflationary impact has been catastrophic. To wit, the average currency has plunged by more than 40% in the past four years, and more than 90% for the four BRICS currencies, i.e. the Brazilian Real, Russian Ruble, Indian Rupee, and South African Rand, not pegged to the dollar. As for the Chinese Yuan, it too is destined to plunge when the aforementioned U.S. dollar strength which will intensify dramatically when the next financial crisis arrives, forces the PBOC to abandon the peg under the aforementioned fallacious belief that a weaker yuan will help the Chinese economy. And if you don't believe me, just look at what's occurred in Japan since Abenomics commenced just over two years ago. During that time, the Japanese money supply has more than doubled, but its trade, trade balance has shifted from decades of surplus to an all-time high deficit. Of course, the Chinese have a secret weapon under their sleeves if the yuan plunges too far, in that, at any time, it could simply announce the gargantuan amount of gold reserves it has undoubtedly acquired over the years, giving it an implicit backing that no other country can boast. And that includes the U.S., which equally undoubtedly, as proven by simple math, has sold, leased, or swapped the vast majority, if not all, of its once bountiful gold reserves. But that's another story for another day. As trust me, the last thing the Chinese government wants to do is upset the apple cart by revealing to the world its desire to remonetize gold. Ultimately, its government knows such an event will occur, and anyone watching the gold markets closely realizes that despite the last four years' price declines, global demand is currently at an all-time high. And this as inventories continue to shrink, as on the COMEX, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and within the GLD ETF. Not to mention, cartel price suppression has all but destroyed the precious metal mining industry, yielding not just speculation, but a reality 
of peak gold, and likely right behind it, peak silver. That may never be reversed. In other words, the gold bull market is alive and well, particularly for the 6.9 billion people who live outside the United States who price gold in currencies that have fallen by 40 to 90 percent since dollar priced gold peaked in 2011. And thus, to the precious metal doom and gloomers, from propagandists in Washington and on Wall Street, to trend following newsletter writers, whom collectively couldn't identify a manipulated market if it smacked them in the face, to a dumbed-down, cheerleading mainstream media with neither the brain power or motivation to identify or report the truth, we simply say thus, follow the money as it never lies. Back to China, the reason they too fear the remonetization of gold is because the short-term shockwaves of such an event would be so powerful, it too would be caught up in them. That is why they don't tell the world how much gold they've acquired, or publicly attack the integrity of fiat currencies, their own included, that threaten them, such as the U.S. dollar. In fact, the PBOC has arguably been the drunkest sailor at the drunk sailor money printing party. In printing the yuan so dramatically, it has created financial and economic bubbles so large, even the U.S. dollar and Japanese yen pale in comparison. That said, they continue to inexorably prepare for the long term by quietly acquiring metal, and not so quietly encouraging their citizens to do the same, whilst planning for the inevitable monetary dominance by expanding gold and silver mining, trading, and deregulation, and spearheading the creation of significant anti-dollar, or better put, anti-West trading blocks that will eventually dominate global trade itself. Fortunately, China can hide its massive PM purchases behind the relative opaqueness of gold and silver trade data, including their own. However, a mosaic of existing data, both empirical and anecdotal, suggests they are currently acquiring gold at a more rapid rate than ever, perhaps anywhere from half to three quarters of all incremental mine supply. And given their three plus trillion dollars of foreign currency reserves, it's quite possible they'll directly or indirectly bid for any and all gold being offered for the foreseeable future, let alone at prices below the cost of production, which no one is more aware of than the Chinese who are undoubtedly producing hundreds of tons of gold and silver each year at an economic loss, knowing full well that one day they will be worth far more. As they say, all in due time. However, with so many potential black swan events swimming around, like Greece for instance, it's entirely possible said changing of the guard will occur far sooner and far more dramatically than most can imagine. And again, when I speak of a changing of the guard, I decidedly do not believe it will occur overnight and certainly not following controlled, collusive discussions between today's leading economic powers via a Sunday night announcement resulting from secret weekend discussions as we witnessed en masse in 2008. No, this time around, it will not, it will not be individual institutions in need of assistance, but governments themselves, as the fraudulent monetary system supporting their them experiences a permanent loss of confidence. This time around, the world's central banks will be powerless to respond, as not only has their ammunition been spent, like the Fed, which took rates to zero seven years ago and bloated its balance sheet from $700 billion to $4.5 trillion, but confidence in their ability to help will be shattered, as it rightfully should be, given how they have cumulatively added hundreds of trillions of debt to the, to the world's debt burden, while its global economic conditions have dramatically collapsed not to mention the unprecedented economic and financial deformations created by such policies, from the historic oversupply of industrial capacity, particularly in the commodity complex, to the highest stock bond and other financial asset valuations of all time. Cumulatively, this unprecedented agglomeration of economic and financial hell must be unwound, and frankly, there is no conceivable way it can be done so tamely, let alone as dictated by the very entities responsible for it. No, this time around, the collapse will be as much about rebellion against the central banks as the inevitable unwinding of the financial bubbles, economic carnage, and social and geopolitical instability they created, whether purposefully or inadvertently. Which, back to David and I's discussion, is why we so emphatically believe the time is now to protect oneself from what's coming, both financially and otherwise, per the time-honored mantra of being prepared for the worst, but hoping for the best. As for the specific black swan that is Greece, although black swan no longer appropriately describes the situation, given how public Greece's problems have become, we are now within days of the Grexit the markets continue to ignore, despite all evidence pointing to its inevitability. And after today's collapsed Eurogroup meeting, its imminence. Here at the Miles Franklin blog, we predicted this would occur more than two years ago, and even then we couldn't have imagined how ugly the situation would have become so quickly. 
Frankly, the only reason anyone could possibly believe this vicious confrontation between the desperate Greek population and its enslaving bureaucratic warlords is because various market manipulation operatives spend every waking moment supporting stocks, bonds, and favored currencies whilst attacking gold and silver prices despite the aforementioned record demand. Not to mention in Germany, where gold and silver sales have jumped parabolically. And trust us, no nation is more attuned to the dangers of the ECB's insane QE scheme than Germany, whose epic hyperinflation in the 1920s still strikes terror in the hearts of German citizens. As I write midday Thursday, Greece is already in arrears on 1.5 billion euros of interest payments to the IMF, though they have been given a temporary pass by the criminal derivatives cartel due to a theoretical loophole enabling them to delay said payments until the end of the month, which, by the way, also marks the end of the current Greek bailout, which, if it is not immediately re-upped to the tune of a new 30 to $50 billion loan, euros, will mean a far more massive default on Tuesday. At this point, meetings between Greece and the Troika have been completely futile, with not even a glimmer of hope of a new bailout agreement, despite what the propaganda tries to have you believe. And even if someone, somehow one is reached by tomorrow, it would take at least two or three days to be ratified by all participating constituencies, which frankly is as unlikely, they are as unlikely to ratify as the negotiators are to actually reach a concrete agreement. And particularly the Syriza-led Greek parliament, which was swept into power four months ago to end austerity and bailouts, and thus restore Greek financial sovereignty. And now, the powers that be will not be able to fool the market, stock, bond, and precious metals, among others, with another fraudulent extension of the current bailout talks, particularly as Greece is literally out of money now. No, the rubber is set to hit the road next week, and to believe the ramifications of a Grexident will not be far-reaching and horrifying is, in our view, extremely naive. As I wrote in last week's End of the New Normal, it's just a matter of time before said manipulations are overcome by economic mother nature and the unstoppable tsunami of reality. And when it does, if you have not already protected yourself from what's coming, it may already be too late. And when the Greek implosion hits the world en masse, or for that matter, any number of other potential catalysts, the aforementioned historic financial and economic deformations will start to unravel, perhaps in a flash, and perhaps like Chinese water torture over a long period of time, which is quite the apt description, given that no nation has contributed more to the unprecedented financial and economic deformations than China, with its insane central bankers and equally insane communist central planners. Financially, global stock markets are, nearly unequivocally, trading at all-time high valuations amidst the worst economic conditions in decades, not to mention an equally gloomy outlook given the horrifying plunge in commodity prices that has swamped the economies and finances of nearly every nation. Global economic activity, notwithstanding the halls of financial engineering in New York, London, and other, and other central bank financed crime dens, has plunged to 2008 crisis levels, as have most commodity prices, whilst debt has exploded by tens of trillions of dollars, destroying the treasuries of countless sovereign nations and the balance sheets of their henchmen central banks. Corporations have used central banks' free financing, as well as direct and indirect market support, to increase leverage far beyond the pre-2000 and pre-2008 levels and speculate on anything not nailed down. Here in the States, said deformations have become even more egregious, fostering horrifyingly inefficient mergers, overvalued IPOs, and the cancerous proliferation of illiquid venture capital investments that has added a whole new level of potentially cataclysmic risk to the most overvalued markets of all time. And no, I'm not using that term flippantly, as when combining objective and subjective data points, stocks, bonds, real estate, and other artificially inflated markets depict the most unfavorable risk-reward profiles of modern times, let alone with interest rates near multi-millennium lows and inexorably creeping higher with each passing week. Again, we ask, what's going on and how does it affect us? What's going on is the end game of a 44-year mad experiment in global money printing, and as anyone with two eyes and a non-biased brain can see, the deformations it caused are worsening with each passing day. Exploding debt, falling employment and wages, political dysfunction, social degradation and instability, currency debauchery, and a surge in cost of living are but symptoms of the fiat disease the world has developed, which is now metastasizing as aggressively as the most terminal cancer. In a nutshell, 
fiat currency regimes define Ponzi schemes in that they must grow larger to survive and do so whilst maintaining a confidence that is impossible to maintain with the proliferation of the aforementioned society killing issues. And thus, the now parabolic growth of global debt and equally parabolic explosion in currency debauching money printing we are witnessing today, providing the tell that said Ponzi scheme is in its final blow off stage. And by the way, the scariest ramification of the upcoming Brexit, which may well occur by the end of July, is that it will empower countless other debt infested nations straddling the wall of the, st of the status quo and the hope of positive lasting change to take their own matters into their hands. Spain will clearly be the next domino to fall, given its Syriza-like Podemos party will likely not only take over Parliament in December, but the presidency as well. And this, in a nation where its wealthiest province, Catalonia, last November voted 90% to 5% in favor of secession. Throw in France, where Marine Le Pen's National Front Party will, largely, will likely take power in 2017, and Italy, where Beppe Grillo's five-star movement is already the largest faction in Italy's parliament, and you could see how fast things could go downhill for the European Union. Let alone in the UK, which may not be a part of the euro currency, but will likely vote to leave the European Trade Union in a 2016 referendum. And that's just Europe, as no matter where one looks, from Japan to South America to the BRICS, the political, economic, and social instability resulting from violent, volatile, violently volatile currency movements are only gaining steam. Even here in the States, these ominous trends are rapidly expanding, as depicted by the recent violence in Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, the bankruptcy of Detroit, Michigan, and of course, Obama's all-time low approval rating, despite the so-called recovery he takes credit for, an all-time high bubble stock and bond markets. The only reason America's problems aren't more highly scrutinized, aside from manipulated stocks, bonds, and economic statistics, is because its status as the reserve currency issuer has enabled it to export most of the Fed's inflation creation to other nations. Not that our all-time high cost of living hasn't destroyed the lifestyles of hundreds of millions of citizens, driving tens of millions to the government printing press funded entitlement rolls. However, compared to the other six plus billion global denizens, the cumulative misery we are experiencing is piddling. And if you don't believe me, consider just how many currencies gold prices are thriving in. Like the Brazilian real, Japanese yen, Russian ruble, and South African rand, for instance. All of which, gold is at or near all-time highs. Or even the so-called first world nations like Canada and Australia. And oh yeah, Europe, where gold prices are just 15 to 20% below their all-time highs. Compared to 35 to 40% in the aforementioned financial crime dens that are the US and the UK. In other words... The forces pushing economic supply up and, su and demand down, and conversely, precious metal supply down and demand up, will only intensify as history's largest fiat Ponzi scheme continues its inexorable movement toward implosion. What can you do about it, you ask? Well, for one, you can admit the truth of your personal reality and pursue, through alternative media sources like the Miles Franklin blog, the truth of the global financial and economic abyss surrounding us. Once you allow said reality to become your base case, it will be easier for you to take actions considered non-mainstream, which in most cases will be invisible to all those around you, like for instance purchasing precious metals, stocking food, water, and other life's necessities, and reducing your personal exposure to the imploding monetary system. Here at Miles Franklin, where we have conducted business for 26 years without a single registered complaint, we can help you not only with the purchase, sale, or storage of precious metals, but a variety of financial planning strategies we have honed over two decades of working with gold and silver. To that end, all we ask is that you give us a call at 800-822-8080 and allow our staff of professionals, on average sporting nearly 25 years of industry experience, to give you a free consultation. And as always, I can be reached by email at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Well, it looks like Angela Merkel just issued an ultimatum to Greece that a deal must be in place by the market open on Monday morning, as if such a deal could be ratified by then, or else. Do you want to be left unprotected when this else occurs, be it Monday in Greece or shortly thereafter somewhere else?